That was a very interesting uh, interview. And now we, it's, we move on to the panel. It's time to discuss geographic and equity roadblocks to cancer care with our panel of experts. Uh, I'm joined here in studio, studio by, with uh, Isabel Duran. Uh, she's president and executive director of the Latino Cancer Institute and member of the National Cancer Advisory Board. And we are joined virtually by Dr. Daniel Derman, Senior Vice President of Administration and the Chief Innovation Executive at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. And joining us in just a minute will be Dr. Lisa Newman, Chief uh, of the Section of Breast Surgery at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Welcome to you all. I do wanna start, Isabel, with you. Uh, you have a personal uh, story. You've invested a lot of your career in educating the Latino community. Uh, also, you were uh, diagnosed, I believe, 20 years ago. Can you tell us about your personal story and where in that 20 years uh, cancer research and the search for a cure has come? Uh, good to be here with you. Uh, but you know, it's really interesting for me because when I was diagnosed 23 years ago, it was because I had a regular screenings, I had a doctor, I could speak the language, I was educated and, and well aware and able to read uh, any kind of medical journals I needed to in order to understand. Uh, so that was not the problem, but I remember when the doctor called me, he said he felt he needed to call me right away. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, he said, I can't believe this, this is cancer. And my first reaction sitting there was, okay, God, this isn't about dying, what's the point? And the second one I had was, I wonder if I should do a story, because I was a television journalist for 43 years, and my immediate instinct was to turn the camera on myself and share with the public what was then, even then, called the big C. So when you think about 23 years later, where I've developed two local nonprofits and then created the Latino Cancer Institute to work at the national level and focus a lot on policy, uh, I think about the fact that we actually went to Stanford back in, tw that, uh, in 2000 and we were asking about advanced uh, cancer research and they were looking at immunotherapy. And now here we are all of these years later and immunotherapy is in use in many can comprehensive cancer centers. What has not changed to a great extent in all of these years is that the disparities still exist. Who's getting access to that? Who can afford it? Who is getting uh, directed into those cancer centers? I think one of the great things I heard from the doctor from City of Hope is in California, they have, uh, they have uh, signed a bill that we supported that would allow Medicaid patients to go to comprehensive cancer centers uh, and get these advanced therapies. Uh, uh, and so there is this like one step forward, but too many steps back. Um, and I think it's really critical that the community be engaged at all levels in order for us to get to the place that Karen Knutson was talking about, prevention and early detection. We have to bring the community into it, we have to educate them, and we have to provide them navigation into these systems so they can get that early detection and they won't become, one, a cancer burden to their family, financial toxicity, which is, becomes that big problem, and they won't be a late stage uh, diagnosis that we have to perhaps, uh, uh, with end of life care, uh, which is, multiple and costly. I sure. mean, it's, it's a really horrible place to be. So we're really trying to change that trajectory. Uh, Daniel, I want to bring you in here. What a, where are we uh, as far as gaps in cancer uh, care right now? And what can Washington policymakers and maybe state policymakers, uh, Isabel mentioned the California legislation, uh, what, what can Washington and, and other policymakers do about it to actually improve quality of care over the next uh, decade? Yeah, unfortunately, we still have a significant set of gaps. And let me give you just some numbers or some facts around that. So let's look at patients that are receiving National Comprehensive Cancer Network care. Less than 50% of patients over a period of time actually have access to that. What kind of variations are there in outcomes? we know that there are significant outcomes in the gap between the mortality, the death rate, in those that are in community centers versus highly specialized cancers. 
there's about a 19 to 20 percent. These are people that are getting treated. Forget about those that don't have access to care. There's about a 20 percent gap between these different centers. Many people are talking about genomics and precision medicine. Mm-hmm. These things are rapidly advancing and the access to them are not keeping up with the um, technologies that are available. I'll allude to that in a minute when we get back to what Washington can do about that. As an example, we know that 10%, 10% of all the cancers are driven by inherited genetic mutations. But across America, only 27% of that 10%. So of that 10%, only one in four are getting checked for genetic testing in that regard. So we know that that's just an example of those that are being treated are in the system. If we look at the kind of things that we can look to both state legislatures or Washington um, that could help us out, I think there are many. The first would be on insurance regulation and making sure that people have access to the most timely medicines and therapies and diagnostics and that those are covered by the various insurance as well. Also, whether it's treatments and getting them covered as well. These are areas that we lag behind and things are moving so quickly that we don't actually have the mechanisms by which to make sure that the treatments as they come online give access to folks. Now the program we're involved with, with City of Hope and others called Access Hope is making some dent, at least in the insured population by making sure that those people everywhere in the country by their employers will have access to the best treatment and care possible. And as far as the access to Medicaid, in Illinois at least, We also, at least at Northwestern, open ourselves up to all of our patients, whether they have Medicaid, Medicare, insurance, or otherwise. And so just as a quick follow-up, what what do you think that uh, out of all of that and some stuff has has moved through Congress, uh, what do you think the Washington policymakers can learn from, from all of that? Well, I think probably the most important thing, given the speed how the field is changing both in uh, diagnostics to make the diagnosis as well as therapies. It's figuring out and making sure that we have access and our patients have access to this cutting edge diagnostics and treatment as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I want to bring in uh, Dr. Lisa Newman, uh, chief of uh, the section of breast surgery at Weill Cornell Medicine and uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital in uh, my hometown of New York City. Uh, Lisa, you know, early, we've been talking about early detection, and you served as chair of the steering committee uh, for the American Association for Cancer Research Cancer Disparity Progress Report. Can you share kind of what were the, the key takeaways from that report? Thank you. Yeah, this Disparities Progress Report was a wonderful opportunity for the AACR to put together kind of a blueprint for understanding the various factors that contribute to uh, cancer disparities. You heard about several of them from Dr. Derman, and I wanted to also build upon his comment about inadequate genetic testing being performed in our patients. Unfortunately, that genetic testing is disproportionately low in communities of color, which means that we are hampered in understanding the types of genetic factors that contribute to uh, cancer incidence and outcome in many of our population subsets, such as African Americans and Hispanic Latino Americans. And this has important ramifications in terms of treatment. The technologies of precision medicine are such that now we can target specific markers on cancers that are related to our genetics. And so if we do not understand some of these genetic markers, excuse me, genetic markers in communities of color, those communities are at a disadvantage in terms of being able to take advantage of these precision medicine technologies. So in the AACR Disparities Progress Report, we discuss some of those inadequate uh, aspects of 
cancer evaluation in communities of color and medically underserved populations. We also have an opportunity to talk about how critical it is to expand the overall research portfolio involving diverse patient populations because cancer at its core is a genetic aberration. And unless you study cancers broadly in communities of all backgrounds, then you're never going to really comprehensively understand the etiology, the cause of a cancer, because you're just getting a snapshot of those uh, cancer genetics in small uh, populations. So having a broad picture of cancer genetics in diverse populations will be extremely important so that we can generalize what we learned from clinical trials. Unfortunately, at this point in time, communities of color are disproportionately underrepresented in uh, cancer research. We also talk about how important it is to diversify the oncology research workforce and to diversify the oncology care providing re re workforce. If we have an oncology research and care delivery workforce that better reflects our patient population, that means that our research is going to be smarter. We will be tapping into the creativity and the brilliance of young minds that unfortunately have been uh, systematically excluded from healthcare professions in the past. And we will deliver health care, cancer care better because that care will be delivered by communities that have uh, perspectives and experiences, life experiences that are more consistent with our patient population. Mm -hmm. uh, Isabel, I want to go to you. We were talking uh, before we got started about cost. You know, mm -hmm. you have what, it's inside baseball, uh, but the FDA uh, approves treatments. But that's not that's that's just one step of the government process, and it also affects the private market, because then if it's uh, if some type of treatment or device is approved by FDA, then it's got to go to CMS for actual payment, mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen this. So I, I want to break down the cost issue because it's so important. You can't have accessibility if you can't afford treatment. What has been your experience with that? Well, having worked in the low-income community, cost is always a barrier. Sure. And in fact, they create, to, to some my experience, they create the barrier themselves. They don't go because they're afraid of the cost. Mm -hmm. So already there's a moving towards late detection. To Dr. Newman's point about access to genetic and genomic testing, uh, what we have seen in some of the work we have done with federally qualified clinics, that there are issues about protocols, when to test, who to test, uh, who's going to pay for it. And, uh, and, and so this creates a, a real backup for some of the women we're trying to help. When we identified 150 women and 30 of them with family cancer history and some tools that we use to test the, the uh, degree, we, de we determined that all 30 of those women needed to go in for testing. It took us one year to get the first woman in to see the, clin the one clinician who could look at her case and determine whether she should get genetically tested or not. It took a year. It took a year. And now we've seen a little, because we helped them create the flow chart. Right. So we're now looking at this once again from a second level of, of uh, research because we, the community, can't go and say, you guys are doing this wrong. It's not working for us. We've got to do it differently. We do have to show evidence base. We do then have to be approved in terms of changing policies, rules, regulations. But most of all, I think you brought it up much earlier, the, the payment regulators, I heard one of the guests say so, mm -hmm. They have to be brought to heel, excuse the expression, because the charges in medicine, the cost of medicine is way over. <laughs> it's sure. way, it's, it's too costly for anybody. So that has to, that has to uh, we have to get that under control. But we're working to show the problem and that despite standards of care, many low income communities and communities who are unaware of the kinds of testing they should be getting, the lack of knowledge about family history, all of these early steps towards intervention, because of all of those gaps in services, we're working to try to bring those together much more quickly, going to the moonshot, sure. uh, the desire for the moonshot to, de to decrease uh, uh, mortality, uh, trying to change 
I, I love Dr. Newman about the changing the pipeline, improving that. We want to expand that pipeline to community health workers. That becomes the bridge to bring folk in early, to educate them, navigate them into systems, turn them over to these now professionals to do the work and smooth the way for them to get their work done. It's a, it's a continuum that needs to be addressed. And, and I think that uh, with President uh, Biden during the Cures Act calling for the development of a community health care workforce, and Governor Newsom putting $10 million into the beginning of the development of a community health care workforce is a recognition. We don't have enough people in the pipeline, and that will be slow all the time. And we don't have oncologists of color in the pipeline. And we don't have Spanish-speaking and other uh, uh, folks of other languages in the pipeline fast enough to do this work. So why can't we start on this end and do more prevention, you know, while we're trying to up the pipeline, up the specialties, up the opportunity to get to these very uh, advanced uh, care? Let's work here in the community and start there and make them our partners and equally invest in them. We have an audience question, and I'm going to direct this uh, to, to, to Daniel. Um, it, this comes from Ian Terrell, Health Research Library and Kaiser Permanente Center for Health uh, Research. And the question is, the ability to fight cancer seems restrained by a shrinking number of qualified caregivers. Uh, how are we addressing the need for more nurses, doctors, and specialists? Uh, Dr. Dermot, can you answer that? Yeah, well, there's a longer term answer that is the pipeline. But I'll give you a shorter term answer that we're working on which is thinking about and using innovation to uh, extend the scope of every provider that we have. And I think I'll use an example that is just meant to be directionally, don't take this to the bank as the, as the right numbers, but let's just say a, a nursing workforce. If a typical inpatient unit has 10 nurses who staff that unit, we're going to figure out over the next five years, because we don't ha literally have 10 nurses to do that. We're going to figure out where the future is going to look something like of the 10, four will be traditional nurses that will staff the unit as they've always staffed them. Three will be not replaced because it's not a matter of replacing, but we don't have enough. Three of the traditional bodies will be served by technology. And for instance, there are remote nursing projects going on now, and there are other uses of technology that are going to solve three of those 10 nurses on a shift. And the other three that typically are, are, were on a shift will probably be some form of just-in-time staffing that will come in, and I don't want to call it a gig economy, but will come in on an as-needed basis. This is just an example in today's terms of different things that we can do. Use of AI technology. If we look at a radiologist and someone who reads, we, for instance, have a program going on at Northwestern where we are augmenting our radiologists and the use of reading of mammograms. And the pilot we have shows that every radiologist is 30% more productive with adding on and using the AI technology. So there's an example of a classic example that's been used elsewhere, typically than in healthcare, to use technology to augment the workforce. So we're going to have to implement these really in uh, super speed time to try to accommodate this because everyone in the pandemic thought that there was a absence of the workforce due to the pandemic. What we've come to realize is that this was an impending crisis that was coming upon us only exacerbated by the pandemic. And as it recedes, those issues are still there. So my short answer is we're going to implement in the short term technology to take every provider and in general, as a goal, try to make the system 30 percent more productive by the use of technology. Uh, Lisa Newman, can you talk about uh, breast cancer survival rates? Uh, have they improved? What what can we learn from that? Everyone knows someone who's had breast cancer. Yeah, we are making huge strides in terms of improving outcomes from breast cancer. 
for all patients overall uh, compared to the past and we deliver breast cancer care better. One of the buzz terms in the oncology community is the concept of de-escalating breast cancer care, so where, which means that we are targeting specific types of breast cancer more appropriately so that the treatment is more effective, but also with fewer side effects. So that's been a wonderful advance in the, uh, the management of breast cancer leading to improvements in outcome. But unfortunately, as has been iterated in this forum, not all population subsets have been to, able to avail themselves of those advances equitably. And so we do still see 40% higher mortality rates from breast cancer in African-American women compared to white American women. Part of this is related to the fact that there are differences in the tumor biology of cancers that are more likely to afflict African-American women. Black women are more likely to get the biologically aggressive triple negative breast cancers. And this is another area where we need much more research to understand the genetic causes of triple negative breast cancer so that we can help to minimize these uh, breast cancer disparities between black women and white women. But the treatments are better, they're more effective, and yes, we are seeing uh, better outcomes from breast cancer. And I'm happy to uh, have witnessed recently that the United States Preventive Cis Task Force is now advocating in favor of average risk American women initiating screening mammography at age 40 compared to their prior recommendation of waiting until age 50. And I have no doubt that this younger age uh, recommendation for mammography is going to save thousands and thousands of lives uh, across the country for women of all racial ethnic backgrounds. We've run out of time. Very informative panel and, and a hopeful one. I want to thank the, the panelists, Dr. Daniel Derman of Northwestern Memorial Hospital, Dr. Lisa Newman of Wild Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital, and Isabel Duran of the Latino Cancer Institute for being with us today. Thank you.